Yes, this is The Other Side on Breakthrough News, our podcast for yes. patrons only. Very happy to have Manolo De Los Santos happy back with be us back. here. Uh, ben Becker is out this week. He will be back for our next podcast. Very excited to have him. Of course, we're videotaping the podcast, which is not just for patrons only, but very excited for everyone who watched the last podcast you were on, Manolo. We gained 10 new patrons from people who saw that. Wow. So shout out to Amazing. those 10 people. We really appreciate you and every added patron is added functionality for breakthrough news. So much of what we've done going to Minneapolis, you know, having all the equipment, everything yes. we need, so much of it has happened because of our patrons. So we really, really deeply appreciate y'all and appreciate everybody who has joined recently, especially. And, uh, you know, I've seen some folks rocking the mugs, rocking the T-shirts, and I appreciate seeing that. Um, but yes, again, Manolo, welcome back. Pleasure to be back. I mean, it's just amazing. Breakthrough has become sort of a new reference for us. It has. It has. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's been a labor of love, but it, it's been exciting as exciting times. I mean, terrible times, but exciting times. And just a quick programming note, too. Manolo will be joining us consistently moving forward for a while here. He's in our pod. So <laughs> in an effort to be as safe and as healthy as possible, we're not trying to bring a million people in here uh, to tape this podcast. That would not be responsible. So Manolo has I'm been willing, willing to, to take join. the risk. I'm willing to take the risk for the rest of the movement to be here with the guys and the team. Um, it's just amazing being with you all here. There's yeah. always just incredible debates, incredible discussions, conversations. I never leave not happy with what we've talked. Well, I appreciate that. And we'll get into to this week. I mean, you know, talking about a momentous moment and one of the things I was thinking about, obviously, we're in quote unquote election season, which, you know, we only think about in the United mm. States in the point of view of our election. But we have Ecuador this year. Uh, you know, Venezuela has a very important yeah. National Assembly election coming up later in the year. Bolivia. Bolivia, of course, which is, you know, perhaps about to take center stage. Uh, so there are so many uh, elections coming up that. Uh, I mean, to lesser and greater degrees may or may not change the status quo, but that nevertheless have become or and will be a reference point for so many of the critical issues mm. that are facing us right now. I mean, obviously, COVID-19, um, we're talking about the countries in the global south. You know, what is the future, neocolonialism or independence and freedom and, and where it stands? And, you know, I just wanted to kind of start there, maybe. I mean, I think Bolivia, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned it, has been the most amazing process to see. I mean, I feel like it's... it's not being talked about enough, but it's, I mean, we'll see what happens in the election. But it does sort of feel like the people's resistance has, to some degree, defeated the coup. I mean, they forced them to even hold these elections. They forced them to allow in a mosque candidate. They forced them to lock in the dates. They can't move it further. I mean, it really has been amazing to see what's happened there. I mean, I think you said that this isn't, these elections aren't necessarily about the status quo, but they are about a huge debate in the region mm -hmm. about how much further will we allow neoliberal capitalism to continue to just rule in full hegemony in the region? Right. And I think the people of Bolivia have sort of been playing a really heroic role for the rest of the continent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in sort of planting a big no in the face of capital and the white supremacist elites in Bolivia. Yeah. I mean, their position of being in the streets consistently. I mean, it's been since the coup. Yes. The masses of people in Bolivia, indigenous workers, miners, have been in the streets nonstop. Yes. Not just to guarantee that these elections happen, but actually to bring about a serious debate about the direction of the country. Mm -hmm. After over 10 years of a revolution in Bolivia, they've said, we're not turning a page back. Right. right. And we might actually see the possibility of, which is unique in the history of Latin America, of a coup being overturned democratically. Right. I mean, it, it may be... The only, I mean, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe Brazil. I mean, the sort of, but that was a managed transition to yeah. democracy. So this may be the only time. And I mean, we think about, you know, so many people recently, of course. I mean, uh, Manuel Zelaya. I mean, you know, obviously what's happening in Ecuador. I mean, yeah, Bolivia seems like very notable, very interesting. And I think it speaks so heavily to the importance of building consciousness inside yeah. movements. I mean, the fact that people immediately mobilized, immediately pushed back, understood what was at stake, because I think some of the criticism in many ways mm -hmm. of Bolivia over the years, maybe ultra-left criticism, but criticism nonetheless, has been perhaps that it was 
there was less open socialist phraseology than, say, Venezuela. And so that was a reflection of a lack of consciousness or a more moderate path or whatever it may be. And I don't know. It seems like a lot of that is being yeah. kind of exploded right now. No, and there are many criticisms that could be made of the process in Bolivia. But I would say many of the criticisms I've seen and heard in in the Western media or mm-hmm. even among left circles in, in the North has been very superficial in the sense that it doesn't look at what have been the grassroots processes building right. under the seams of what seems to be only state-led politics in, in Bolivia. I mean, Bolivia has a vibrant list of social movements yeah. and organized masses that have clearly not given up on their projects of building socialism. Mm-hmm. It's going to take a while and it's going to take a process. And I think something they've realized that many of us outside of Bolivia haven't really paid attention to is that the stakes are really high yes. on this. It's not just about regaining democracy in a bourgeois representative way. Mm-hmm. It's about the livelihood of the people, not just for Bolivia, for in the region. Yes. Because what's at stake is the mineral resources of the country. It's the right of the people to their natural resources. Yes. And even though there are many critiques about the extractive economies in, under Evo Morales, this is still about how resources are used in benefit of the people. Right. And it's like, what do people expect is going to happen? I mean, so if Evo Morales was not removed, it was removed and Añez replaced her that they were going to leave the yeah. lithium in the ground. I mean, it would be even more exploitative on every possible level, and it would have no connection to sovereignty in any way, shape, or form. I mean, I remember, you know, Elon Musk tweeting out the thing, and, and of course, Tesla stock has gone up 400% over the course of this pandemic, um, which says something about the casino nature of capitalism, but talking about uh, the U.S. will coup whoever we want to coup. And people said, oh, well, Tesla doesn't get lithium from uh, Australia, but then two weeks, I mean, they get all their lithium from Australia, but then two weeks later in the Financial Times, there's this whole issue about how, because Tesla and these other countries are now ve- companies are very concerned there won't be enough lithium supplies for batteries and you can see the through line you can see the connection and you know basically this return not even return but well yeah return to this colonial style extraction i mean to me that has so much content in it that I find it so disappointing to see people often, you know, especially in the global north, uh, kind of dismiss that sort of sovereignty element of it and the importance of beyond Bolivia as a particular country, the importance in general of countries having sovereignty, whatever exactly we think about their uh, uh, particular policies, I mean, people are going to break free from the chains of neocolonialism and imperialism in an uneven way. So, like, what is the type of system uh, that we have in this world, one that refuses to recognize the legitimacy of that, or one that recognizes that people need to determine their own destinies? That's why I really think, and I think many different folks have been talking about this in quiet ways, about the era of national liberation is not dead yet. Yeah. I think many of our peoples and many of our countries are still fighting for that sense of sovereignty and having to sustain it against an even more powerful enemy than mm-hmm. we did in the 25th, 25th century. I think part of the challenge now, though, is how do you make this not just about Bolivia? Right. I mean, the project of the coup in Bolivia is not just of attacking the rights and getting mineral rights in Bolivia. It's a project of re asserting the domination of the U.S. in the whole region right. and asserting it and also t- a clear challenge to China, mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. the project of China leading a sort of multilateral, you know, solidarity economy in relationship to Latin America. Right. So these are all things to sort of look, look at when we even look at the process of the Constituyente in Chile as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. All these electoral processes are sort of in ways tied to either, again, not a stat- question of status quo, but whether we continue to allow U.S. domination yes. in the region or we push for a sovereign path for our peoples? Yeah, I think it's an important question. I mean, I always say to people about the role of China in the world, I mean, just put yourself in the shoes of perhaps Thomas More, if you will. <laughs> Write your own utopia about the perfect country and the perfect way you want it to go. The reality is, is any one territorial entity will have to deal with the world to get all the things they need. There's only one country that has significant economic power to really allow you to operate with its own space that doesn't care what kind of government you have, and that's China. The United States is going to overthrow your utopia and try to color revolution it. Europe is going to definitely say that they are all above board, but behind the scenes do everything possible to undermine you and shade you on human rights. Um, And so I think even in these ideal circumstances, we have to recognize, again, the issue of criticism. There's many criticisms that could be made, but the objective situation of how do we get from point A to point B, an imperialist, capitalist, exploitative world to a peace people-centered, socialist world. I don't see how you get from point A to point B without some countries emerging 
in the existing relationship of forces that start to raise the horizon yet again of the possibility of revolution. And, and I think moving to Venezuela, that's exactly what I think exactly. was so notable about the Bolivarian revolution is that Chavez's vision was so broad, the Chavista vision, that it was able to speak to the world in the new century about these age-old ideas of human emancipation. And I think, you know, that's so much at what's at stake in this National Assembly election and why the U.S. is at such pains now, even though many of their friends want to participate in the elections, they're sanctioning the head of the CNE uh, and, and trying to do whatever they can to, to make the, the, the results seem illegitimate. But again, I think this is an important question of how are we going to start to you know, build and then support projects that are helping to, to give us that new horizon to move towards. Yeah. But I think you know, Venezuela is another good example because despite how much money, despite the millions of funding that the U.S. has put openly and secretly mm -hmm. into the Venezuelan opposition, they have not been able to actually mobilize it. Right. It has been clearly divided. It lacks leadership. And it doesn't pose any real program for the people, mm -hmm. which is why a great majority of people in Venezuela are still convinced that, again, either we go back to a period of being fully dominated with yeah. no process of development under U.S. imperialism, mm -hmm. or we continue building on this path with all its challenges, yes. even if it means more years under sanction. I mean, I think it's a it's it's a heroic act, and I think you're you're so right that there is no other path. I mean, to see people like Enrique Capriles and other major opposition figures basically say, "Listen, like this this cannot work. Like you cannot have a situation with the United States trying to constantly overthrow the country, sanctioning the country, destroying every possible economic tie the country has with anyone in the world. I uh, just can't operate." I mean, that to me, in a way, that feels like a huge victory. I mean, not only was the opposition split. But now some of the people who are really enemies of the Bolivarian Revolution are having to operate in a framework by which they are accepting to a large degree the, the sort of gains of the Fifth Republic, if you will, you know, the new constitution that was passed, all these different elements that they for years wanted to rip away and deny that they had a reality, deny that tens of millions of people in the country supported them. Now they basically are in a position, I mean, it's it's the contradiction of this. Obviously, this has been so terrible, but I think it really has revealed the bankruptcy of any project that's going to try to reverse to a pre-1998 status quo. And even some of, you know, the most pro-capitalist, pro-Western elements have recognized they have no political future. Yeah unless they recognize that framework. And that bankruptcy, to be honest, is not the bankruptcy of the opposition itself. It's mm. not the bankruptcy of these right-wing Venezuelan leaders. It's actually the bankruptcy of the imperialist project of the United States, mm. which for a long time insisted on the idea that it provided an American dream, that it could provide right. an alternative, that it could provide sort of like a guide or a model of development mm -hmm. that people could sort of tie themselves to and sort of progress. Right. That was a big 20th century. Sure, sure, sure. But that's non-existent now. Yeah. What does the U.S. have to offer to the world? <laughs> it has no <laughs> real... We can't even make masks. <laughs> I mean, what can it really offer to the Venezuelan people right now? Mm. I don't think it has anything to offer. And we see that ideological bankruptcy of U.S. imperialism going into full gear at the same time that it's coming into a decay of its ability to retake control over the planet. Yeah. And I would say... The example that the Venezuelan people are giving, the example of the Bolivian people, is actually providing a real example of what progress and development could look like for us in the 21st century. Yeah. Because it's finally a model that isn't based on unilateralism. Right. And it's not based on only making profit. Finally, people's lives are actually being put at the center of things. Yeah. I mean, that, I think... It's, it's almost so profound that you don't even notice how profound it is because it's such a different reality. I mean, I think those of us who've been privileged enough to go around Venezuela, I mean, we talk about grassroots politics, building this. I mean, you know, the grassroots, I, I really always encourage people, they have to read the Chavez, I guess, memoir-ish interview with Ignacio Ramonet. I yes. mean, the book is, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a revelation. And just how he lays out the vision behind it and, and him that he and others developed and the long prehistory. Because, it you know, the, to be in the position of 98 was this long prehistory of the formation of communes, the radical political parties, the movement inside the military, and all these elements kind of starting to cohere all at once. And I think that 
sort of grassroots politics gets pushed to the side. And that's one of the things I think when you're there on the ground is really easy to see is sort of the grassroots basis of Chavismo and why I think for many people who've had experience with Venezuela, it was clear that this coup was going to have a lot of difficulty succeeding because if you've just been on the ground, it's clear. But the way it's reported, I mean, I remember when, uh, what's it's his just name? They've been demonized so much. So demonized. That the details, we missed the details. We missed the actual, we, we failed to humanize the process. Mm. And we demonize, we put Chavez at the center of the demonization process to the point that we actually forget that Venezuela has been in a state of revolutionary upheaval decades going back. Yes. And that Chavez is a product of that process. Yes. Chavez could only come up out of that process. He's almost like an Abraham Lincoln-esque figure. I mean, I hate to say it like that, <laughs> but at a major turning point, a figure emerges. Uh, you know, I guess communists might want to use Lenin, but I'm trying to be a little bit more circumspect here, um, you know, that, that emerges as the the true representative of the aspirations of millions of people. And it yeah. really is millions of people. And, and it, quite frankly, it's been extraordinary how people have held on. And so much of that, I think, is the, the collectivity and how people care for each other and work with one another and have that kind of grassroots resistance base to it. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out in the National Assembly election. I mean, it, it definitely seems like it's going to be much more difficult for the U.S. to really convince the rest of the world that they should declare this not legitimate. I think it might be the most people voting in a long time. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, again, I would say very odious figures who hated Chavez, who are participating and seem to feel they're going to do well, and maybe they will. Um, and I think that in and of, I mean, it reminds me a little bit, and I, I use this example a lot of, of the end of apartheid, like the 80s, yeah. in that the apartheid regime became so much more violent, but it was really a reflection of the fact that the ideological basis was crumbling. And I think that's what the U.S. policy towards Venezuela represents, and I think that's at least what we could start to see in this National Assembly election is the crumbling of this unified front against Venezuela that the U.S. has constructed because it's just too much of an alternate reality, I think, um, to, to recognize without the hypocrisy becoming a liability. And I think when you look at these elections, the ele elections in Venezuela, in Bolivia, in Chile, across the world right now, in light of the U.S. elections mm -hmm. and the farce and the ridiculousness of which these elections are sort of being held— actually makes you think that the building of democracy is actually advanced much more in places like Venezuela. Yeah. Regardless of what the results are on the 6th of December in Caracas, we know that there's actually been a democratic process that has involved millions of people in actually making profound decisions on their lives. Yes. And that the decisions don't end on that election day. Right. Versus the U.S. where we see a country that is mired into sort of making decisions between worse <laughs> and a little bit worse um, with not being able to actually make those profound decisions for themselves. Right. No, I think that's such a good point. And I mean, it's to swing back to an earlier point we made, I mean, these other elections, I mean, there's really a serious question about the future of neoliberalism. And that's exactly what's not on the table in, in the United States. I mean, we've already seen, and you know, for those of you who follow Breakthrough News, you've seen the video that we did about Joe Biden. I mean, on the one hand, he's saying, I'm gonna do X, Y, Z. On the other hand, in the private meetings with Wall Street donors, he's saying stuff like, nothing will fundamentally change. He's telling them he's proposing no major legislation or no legislation at all, he said, to address uh, income inequality and the excesses in corporate America which, as I point out in the video, is wild because he actually is proposing those changes. So, like, who's he really lying to? And then you've got the Democrats in Congress also putting points out saying that they are not going to, uh, you know, be super aggressive on a whole range of po of policies. And you see at the end, of the, I mean, we're in this situation in the U.S., and you know this well, it's like a Faustian bargain every four years where it's assumed that since you have no agency and you have no ability to affect things, uh, you just have to accept one of the lesser of two evils. And there's never a conversation about how do we break that binary and really start to create a ground where neoliberalism can be challenged in a real way. And, and to me, this to me, this is what, what the whole argument comes down to. What is the explanatory power we give to elections? I mean, I think elections to me mediate disputes within the system. They don't necessarily lead to transformative change 
uh, of the system itself. There has to be a much more thoroughgoing effort. I mean, to give the example of Venezuela, right? I mean, a whole new constitution, a whole new, I mean, a whole new set of structures, policies, and even that could certainly probably go further. And, and many people recognize that. And that's certainly what uh, President Chavez was proposing, that they should go much further and much deeper. But recognizing without transformational juridical change, you can't just have different policies, but the same words in the governing document, uh, you're not really going to get much of anywhere. And so I think that, you know, you look at what's happened in this country with Biden starting to do well, there's a real direct correlation between Trump launching the attack on protesters in Lafayette Park, the millions of people who flooded into the streets in the week or week or two after that, and a whole new political dispensation that put Trump on the back foot and allowed Biden to accelerate forward. So the real issue that was changing things transformatively was not Biden. It was the insurgent movement of millions of people. I mean, the only thing that put this country into shock. Yes. That put the whole political con class in this country to actually question itself and question its ability to maintain hegemony and control in this country was people on the streets. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anything that any candidate was able to say. Yes. Democrat or Republican. It wasn't anything that any of the spokespersons of the imperial ruling class in this country had to say mm -hmm. was capable of actually creating the level of reaction that we're seeing now. In fact, I would say... To me, the most impressive element of looking at these elections in the U.S. is that ultimately it was working class young people mm -hmm. on the street, on the verge of desperation, with nothing else to do. Yes. With no other recourse, because this political system didn't allow them any mm -hmm. other recourse to act politically in this country, took to the streets and actually shifted the political spectrum in this country. Yeah. I mean, it's when we talk about what we can learn from the global South. It, you know, it reminds me of uh, a, something I read in uh, mm, anyway about Brazil. I'll, the book and the person will come back to me, and I'll remind you and I'll tell you. But uh, about the formation of the Workers Party in Brazil and the conversations about why they formed the Workers Party. And for people who don't know the story. It was like a few unions that were insurgent unions because you're in this dictatorship, uh, radical left parties that some had been underground, some trying to operate above ground. And basically they all came together and said, we're going to collaborate. We're going to try to do this new project, the Workers Party, and we're going to try to challenge, um, you know, for the working class in the political system, which or challenge for democracy and then subsequently challenge in the limited democracy that was that was led up to it. It's more complicated than that. But I say that to say reading the some of the things about the formation and the conversations is the 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 analysis that the biggest because they were in a similar situation in a way where sort of working class politics was totally subject to sort of bourgeois imperatives and that what was really the key missing element was there wasn't a platform of working and poor people like on that basis that could then use the elections in some strategic way to push the agenda of that population. And it seems to me recognizing the role of mass protest, of strikes, of, of those, the question becomes for, for militants, you know, for people who really do want to change society, what is our main task? Is our main task to just take the worst of two options in an election that quite frankly, you know, we will have very limited impact on? Or is it to try to use the period of the elections, the elections themselves, and all of our other time, of course, trying to build a new reference point of working class and poor? I mean, there's 140 million poor people in this country. And if even 50 million of those people were acting in concert in the streets and at their, work, at their workplace, you know, Congress would respond to that. They would have no choice. Uh, a, a candidate emerging from a movement like that would have a credibility that would be able to really bring transformative change into it. So it seems to me like that's the key area of work. And that's what we're missing is that so much of the quote unquote left agenda just becomes an adjunct every four years to a Democratic Party election campaign. And there's no sort of strategic discussion about how to create more of a of a, of a working poor people centered movement of millions of people that not just in a one off like what we saw this not not a one off but not just in a spontaneous way like we saw this summer but in, a, in an organized way can really start to exercise power in, in, a, in a real sense I mean uh, to me a key element in understanding this challenge not just for militants but for people as a whole in this moment mm. who try to make a better understanding of what we're living through is we often don't have full consciousness of our capacity as a working class. Right. We see ourselves as the weak force in this correlation of forces. Mm. We see ourselves as the incapable. And we actually haven't fully sized up what happened 
this summer. Right. I mean, I think we're right. we're still sort of coming out of this period, not fully understanding what mm. the capacity was of the people right. to lead right. through over a hundred days of protest. Yes. And change the political scenario in this country. And there's a second element, which is that we don't size up our enemy. Right. We have no full understanding of the internal disputes and the weaknesses that they're displaying at this mm. moment. To the point that we just assume, and I think very despondently, a lot of the left assumes that the working class in the United States is not actually capable of a revolutionary change. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. I think that's true. Who, 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 who are we? Who are our people to actually go beyond two silly options? Mm. That's real. And I think the example of Brazil that you raise up, I think ultimately what the Workers' Party did at a key moment in Brazil's history was actually raise the self-esteem of the working class right. to go from just the strikes, the really key strikes mm -hmm. in the metalwork uh, regions of, of southern Brazil to yeah. actually go beyond that and go for political power. Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of what's missing in our scenario is these are not our only options. Yes. And the left that continues to believe that these are the two only options that the working class has is a left that doesn't believe in the working class. Yes. Yes. And I think part of our process of building hope and actually building a reference for working class people is actually saying we're not there yet. Yeah. But we have a potential and a capacity to out-organize the ruling class. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it because we've known many revolutionaries around the world have done it. Right. It's not the first time. Right. Right. And they always come from a low base. I mean, it's, that's the other thing. People say, well, what can we do right now? As if if you can't make all the change at once, it's not worth doing. But no, I think the issue of creating a reference point is so key. And and and, and the, there's so I mean, there's so many examples that weigh so heavily. But I mean, there's also the historical reality that, you know, we've had lesser of two po evil politics. The left has agreed to that every election since '84, really before then. But let's just say then. And the political spectrum has only moved further to the right. I mean, you know, Jimmy Carter was the kickoff of neoliberalism. Bill Clinton did some of the most destructive things ever for the working class. So there's no real evidence, as people say, that it's guaranteed to be better under the Democrats or that there's better organizing territory. But that's, I think, coming out of a sense that we don't know who we are facing right, right now, and I don't think we're fully cognizant that the project of the extreme right. Mm -hmm. expresses itself in both candidates. Yes. The project of white supremacy, of not just neoliberal capitalism, but a full-on raging capitalism mm -hmm. that takes away life of the human people, is at the center of this. Right. And regardless of who wins, this is not just us saying either or wins, right. and it's fine. It's us, whoever wins, the project of the extreme right wins. Yes. The project of the extreme right that will continue to t attack the rights of workers, that yes. will continue to take away health care away from the people, that continues to evict millions of people, that mm -hmm. will continue to deport millions of people, that will continue on its death march, it's still going to win. Yes. And regardless of who wins, we also have to realize that the fact is that this extreme right is mobilizing, not just in government, but on the streets as well. Yes. They talk about the militias. They talk about... QAnon, but there are other sort of groups that are mobilizing from the extreme right to mm -hmm. sort of take advantage of this moment. Mm -hmm. And a question for our militants, for people in the movements, for people who are concerned, for people who, who care about the future of humanity, this is really the moment where beyond the elections, we need to be worried about the two other options. Either right. we continue to slip into or we start this. to pull back in the other direction. Yeah. We have to do something. I, I, I mean, you eventually... If, you have to recognize when you're going in the wrong direction. And it feels like that's, and, and you know, I don't know, people maybe pay lip service to it, but they don't ever really, it seems to me, there's always just such a shaming of anyone who wants to prioritize building working class power as opposed to just being a sheepdog for the Democrats. And I'm not trying to, you know, hate on anyone, but I said this to someone the other day, I've been doing a little research. 70, in 2016, 74 million sort of unambiguously working class people. It's tough to pull that from the statistics, but this is my own research. 74 million people who I think are definitely working class people did not vote in 2016. That's like 10, 12 million more than Trump who won the election. It's actually usually the person who wins the election. It's only about 62 million votes. Now, of course, 84 million people who are workers did vote, but people who also vote in the presidential elections almost never vote in the local elections. So you look at Chicago, for instance, I looked at a precinct where the the young man who was shot this year and it led to people trashing the mag mile um 20 some percent 23 percent of people voted in the last two mayoral elections and 
There's an interesting comparison between that, and I'll try to tie this all together, in that, you know, the policies of the federal government are mainly carried out at the state and the local level. So, like, someone like a Barack Obama can say, I'm going to provide, or let's, I'll give you a better example, Elizabeth Warren and her plan. She's always got a plan. I'm going to get $500 billion or whatever to housing. But when you look at her plans, it's mainly for the same style uh, or the same rhetoric we see now. And these local housing authorities, they take that rhetoric and they use that money to promote gentrification. And so people might vote for president thinking, oh, it's more important. But the reasons they're alienated from their local politicians and never vote is because the actual implementation of the policies, as you right. say, really is the policy of the extreme right. I think that's something people often don't understand about America, is that even though the Democrats have a much better song and dance, on the local and state level, they are often, you know, some of the most neoliberal pro-capitalist policies out there. Certainly, they are the cornerstone of support for the exactly. worst police departments in America comes, you know, the Muriel Bowsers of the world, people like that, who are allegedly for Black Lives Matter, and they support every police shooting and every brutal policy. Um, but to tie it all back in together, it's the thing I hate the most about the lesser of two evil arguments. People say, well, don't you want just a little bit of change? And I think it speaks to not knowing our enemy and not knowing ourselves that Okay, if 74 million working class people didn't vote, 84 million people did vote, it seems to me that there's really no consensus about how critical this election was. Some people think, yeah, it will bring a little change for me, so maybe I'll do something. And I hear that. And other people are like, look, nothing ever really changes in my life, no matter who's in office at any level, so why would I vote? And I think there are kernels of truth in both things, and they have yeah. to be parsed a lot more. But this whole idea that comes from petty bourgeois middle class people that like not voting is somehow privileged, uh, to me, totally ignores the reality of the working class, the political reality of working class consciousness, and how we bridge the gap between the two sides of the class about what's possible. And, and, and we need a unified platform uh, that's what I was trying to bring out with that example of Brazil. I'm kind of rambling here now, but uh, I just wanted to get some of those statistics out there because I think they're relevant to know because so much of the lesser of two evil arguments, I think, is based on just things that aren't factually relevant exactly. and no real investigation. But like, No, and that leads us down, yeah. a, I think, a dangerous path because yeah. I think there's a discourse that goes along with it that we must support Biden to hold off Trump. Right. And because somehow we will hold Biden accountable mm. to working class demands or politics. Yeah. And I think apart from being a really bad misconception, it starts off from, I think, the worst place of not even organizing the working class as a whole first. Right. It comes from the idea that who will hold them accountable? Right. These individual leaders? NGOs that are funded by the billionaires who support Biden and so, don't want him to do these things? I think the 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 future of this country really will ultimately be decided again in the streets. Yes. And I think the organizations that begin to take the working class seriously, that actually see the working class as the true subject of history, capable of actually changing our, our time and our moment, will be the ones who will be right at the end of this. Not yeah. necessarily those who insist in sort of playing the devil's game of narrowing us into these two options only. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a crucial point. Final point I want to raise here is to speak to all of this. It seems to me that internationalism is such a key factor in forming this kind of working class consciousness because, you know, not, not in a rote way, but because I think so much of why these ideas are so strong, eh, the lesser of two evils and so on, is people are dealing only in a strictly American context and not bringing in reference points from around the world, which, of course, tell you different things, but that beyond just the need for global international solidarity in a global internationalized world of capitalism, that there is, is, is quite not only quite a bit to learn, but just reference points to constantly kind of be checking your own situation off against to get a better sense of, of what's possible, what can be done, um, and how it can be done. And I feel like being 100% trapped in this sort of America-centric American exceptionalist framework about how we view elections, how we view the American working class, how we view the tasks of the future, which I think is the other question that you raise very intelligently is, is, is what are people really trying to do? Do they actually believe in revolution? Because if you believe if you don't, then fine, go lesser of two evils. I can't even really yeah. fault you for that. But if you think that, you know, climate catastrophe, income inequality, uh, you know, billions of people living in poverty with, uh, you know, three people controlling more wealth than 50 percent of the entire planet. Uh, and all these things can just be solved without transformative change, which is all a revolution really is, is transformative and, change. And, the f and I think an issue is that when it, when it comes to connecting this to internationalism is that we don't fully yet see that while there are internal disputes within 
the ruling class in this country. Yeah. If there's something there's full agreement on, and there seems to be so much consensus between the ruling class, is on maintaining the U.S. imperial project abroad. Yes. There's no debate internally about continuing to wage war on China. That's right. And encircle China. There is no discussion or debate about not asserting domination in Latin America yes. again. There is no debate about not attacking Cuba and Venezuela. There is no debate within the ruling class at this point about how they continue to approach taking yes. resources out of the African people's hands. Mm -hmm. So I think when we look at internationalism, it's not just a question of saying we believe or we are in solidarity with, but is when we look at this crucial moment in the history of the people of the United States yeah. is not just the interests of the American people that, were, that are at stake. Mm. It's the interest of humanity, mm. and which includes the United States people, but has to take into consideration the needs of the people of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Yeah. I think often that gets forgotten. It does and We think forgotten. that what is best for the U.S. people in whatever given moment is what's best for everyone else on the planet. Right. I think... The reason why everyone is looking at the elections in the U.S. is for the same reason. Whether Biden or Trump wins, the consequences are catastrophic for the yeah. rest of the planet. I mean, we're not even sure if there will be a vaccine that will be readily accessible to everyone. I know. At this point. We don't know what will be the response of the United States in the face of another pandemic. Mm -hmm. Or a second wave or third wave of this current right. pandemic. All these questions really make us think, from an internationalist perspective... The U.S. project, whoever wins, has no interest in preserving life on this planet. Yeah. No, I think that's 100% true. I, 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 I'm I, with you 100%. Manolo, fantastic to have you with us as a third host when we get Ben Becker back <laughs> and as a second host today. That's going to do it for us here on the other side on Breakthrough News. Of course, always check out everything that's up on our YouTube page, our Facebook page, our Twitter, Instagram, at BT Newsroom across social media. You can find everything we do there. And much, much appreciation to all our patrons who are listening to this podcast because it's your contributions and sacrifices that make this possible. So we'll see you next time.